If you've ever been to the CS gas chamber while in the military, and on your way there, you started betting with your buddies that you'd take the biggest breaths possible and you'd really hype yourself up, and you got in there and you did it, and it was a really bad idea, go ahead and hit that subscribe button or give me some stories from the CS gas chamber for my military, and, excuse me, for my law enforcement guys. If you've been tased or pepper sprayed, and I know you have, give me some stories. Always interested to hear them, only been tased once, and I screamed like a bitch. Like, comment, if you have anything uh, important to say, it's probably going to get lost in, del in the deluge of um, confused homoeroticism that is my comment section, but get in there, I can't control you guys. If you're looking to support me, there are two ways you can support me. You can either buy some sick plaid through Vertex or bags or pants or multicam pants. I actually make some good ones. I'm going to be doing a review on them in a little bit. Or you can buy yourself some ammo if you already have a bunch of stuff uh, to wear and then you can get some training in because it's always important to train. Discount code for both those things is going to be Grantham. So again, Vertex Freedom Munitions, get in there. Finally, Patreon. So big shout out to my Patreon subscribers for helping me out. Now, some of you have been like, why are you doing Patreon? You said that you weren't a slut. Good question. So Things have changed. YouTube uh, is now demonetizing gun channels. Not a big deal, but uh, you know I make some money off YouTube and that helps me support because this is again a full-time job on top of a full-time job. Now the problem is, is that YouTube is very anti-2A and there's a lot of anti-2A organizations that are funded by YouTube or that they get their payment from and all that kind of stuff. So we're trying to get away from that. That way we're not getting funding from anti-2A organizations or contributing funds to anti-2A organizations. And that is why we are doing Patreon. So hope that answers your questions. If you don't agree with it, it's not your decision. So <laughs> welcome to the free world. So let's get into the topic at hand. The Elcan Spectre Dual Roll Optic, which is either a one or a four times magnification optic, depending on what you set it at. Now this optic is uh, somewhat maligned or somewhat loved, depending on who you talk to. I'm getting, getting a lot of requests to review it. So quick heads up on this. Yes, I've used this in, in the service, but there are other guys who have had uh, a lot more opportunities to spend a lot more quality time with this in combat. So guys like Mr. Guns and Gear and a couple other I can't name off the top of my head, I have a lot of time on these. I would definitely recommend looking at their reviews to get their perspective on this optic. Because again, mine is from a non-combat perspective perspective because I've never gone into combat with the Elcan Spectre. Quick note there. Uh, or been in a gunfight with the Elcan Spectre. So there we have it. But I'm going to give you some of my thoughts on it, what I've uh, seen in my time using it. Um, I'm at about 8,000 rounds on it right now. And then also uh, what my buddies' uh, experiences have been who have had the opportunity to use it in a good gunfight. Uh, not that all gunfights are good, but some of them are exhilarating. The Elkan Spectre, as you can see, is a really short kind of squat optic. Um, a lot more short and squat than, say, something like a low-power variable, such as an EOTech or something like that. You can see how long that one is. This is the EOTech Voodoo. Good times on a Geisley mount. Geisley. You can go from 1x to 4x, um, not by rotating a ring like you do on a low-power variable optic, but rather by flipping a switch. This little switch right here, you simply take the lever, depress it, and push it forward. Now you're in 4x mode, push it back, and then push it down and across, and then you go back to 1x. So it's a pretty quick switch between the two. It's very intuitive and easy to use. Now compare that to a low power variable optic, and you rotate this ring to go across. Not quite as quick. Now at the same time, I go from 1 to 6 times magnification, and I can go from 1, 1 1.5, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, so I can get anywhere in between. While as with the Elcan Spectre, I either have 1 or 4, there's no in-betweens there. You can try the in-betweens, but there's nothing. It's just kind of a weird refracted mirror that you're looking through. So it's not going to work for you. Now, the optic uh, itself weighs approximately 23 ounces. That's roughly comparable to what you're seeing from a lot of low-power variable optics. There are, of course, lighter ones, but you have to remember that these optics, a lot of the low-power variables, are measured without the mounts. So, with the mounts included, usually seeing them pretty much on par. So, with those things in mind, let's talk about some of the pros and the cons of the Elcan Spectre from my time using it, and also from some of my buddies' perspectives who have had the opportunity to use it in some different environments. So first things first, what is the Elcan Spectre good for? Because no doubt there are other optics that have greater magnification range than the Elcan Spectre. 
So what I really like about the Elkan Spectre is I like running it on shorter rifles. And the reason for that is because it's so short and squat, it tends not to take up near as much space on a short build rifle, like say a Mark 18, than would a EOTech Voodoo or a Vortex Gen 2 or something like that, or whatever low power variable you're running. So because of that, it fits a little bit better and you have a little bit more space. Another thing that I like about the Elkan Spectre is that the eye relief is a little bit shorter than a typical low power variable optic, but that's good for an AR, especially a short barreled AR, because it means I don't have to have that optic as far forward or on some type of weird gooseneck mount that puts it forward. So because of that, I'm able to set it further back, which helps balance the rifle a little bit more. So I find that the Elkan Spectre bounces quite well on short barreled rifles. So again, the eye relief on the Elkan Spectre is around 2.2 inches, somewhere right around there. So I'm bringing it up to my shoulder. This is my proper eye relief right at this location right here. And that's about perfect, that feels really good. I'm not nose a charging handle like I would be on a ACOG or anything like that. And flipping from 1X to 4X, I don't have to shift my position, so it works quite well for me. One of the, another great thing about the Elkan Spectre is how clear the glass is. It's like Trijicon level of clear. And again, I would consider it a competitor to Trijicon in one uh, aspect or another. So you have some really clear glass that's right on par with Trijicon. And another thing that's pretty comparable to Trijicon is the field of view. The Elkan Spectre has a ginormous field of view. At four times magnification, you're seeing approximately 34 feet. Compare that to the Trijicon ACOG, which is pretty legendary for its massive field of view. And the Trijicon ACOG is 36 feet. So it's still larger than the Elkan Spectre, but at the same time, the Trijicon ACOG doesn't go from the four times magnification down to one X like the Elkan Spectre does. Now, the Elkan Spectre has an enormous field of view at one X, even larger than most of the low power variable optics that you see on the market right now, like the EOTech Voodoo or the Vortex Razor and those types of things. So at hundred meters at one X, you see approximately 146 feet. That's huge compared to the Vortex Razor Gen 2. You're looking at about 116 feet. So, Massive field of view, extremely clear glass, makes for a very usable optic. And what's really nice about it too is besides having that huge field of view, you also have a very forgiving eye box. So yeah, some optics have greater eye relief, but moving your head side to side and around, a lot of those optics tend to just black out immediately. The Elk Inspector is a little bit more, well not a little bit, quite a bit more forgiving than a lot of those optics that you see out there in the market that I'm familiar with at the moment. Because of that, it's much easier to use this in unconventional shooting positions, like around barricades, around cars, under cars, over cars, that type of thing. Another reason it's so easy to shoot in those weird positions is the reticle. The reticle is very simple to use and it's easy and it's intuitive. Now, it's not quite on the ACSS level, and I do hope that they put an ACSS in one of these someday in the future. But if they don't, um, the reticle on this Elkan Spectre is still good to go. The Elkan Spectre also has an extremely bright reticle. So regarding the reticle itself, to activate it, you can go one of two ways. If you go to, you go counterclockwise, you're gonna hit little dots. That's going to illuminate a dot, much like an aim point, and it does get aim point bright. It's pretty awesome, to be honest. Now, if you rotate away from the dots clockwise, you hit this little crosses. Those crosses are illuminating the entire reticle. What's cool about that is that when you illuminate that first reticle right there, that's night vision use, and it's extremely usable under night vision. So compared to a lot of low power variable optics where I'm not able to use them at all under night vision, I'm able to use the Elkan Spectre because of its illumination and also its ability to transmit light through the optic. I'm not sure if that's due to how short it is or some other combination. I'm not an engineer, I'm just a shooter. But in any case, it's very usable compared to other low power variable optics that I've dealt with up to this point. So it's kind of a pleasure to shoot under night vision if you need to do that. A couple cons when it comes to the Elkan Spectre are the adjustments. So all the adjustments are external. That's pretty atypical compared to a lot of optics which have internal adjustments. So there's a lot of concern that bumping or hitting the rifle or the rifle being used in you know, a combat environment or a gunfight might bump it to the point where it loses its zero. So personally, there's a couple of different generations of Elkans out there. So the latest generation, which is where my experience has been based on, um, I have not seen that personally. But I have heard that the windage and elevation knobs have suffered from time to time. But with latest gen models, I have no qualms about it having those problems. 
When it comes to zeroing your rifle, for the elevation, there is a small lock on the right-hand side of the optic. Simply push that up and then you can change the elevation. For the windage, you simply need a flathead screwdriver and you can change that. Another con is going to be the dot size. So at 1x, the dot size is 6 MOA. Compare that to when it's at 4x and that dot size is 1.5 MOA. 1.5 MOA is awesome. I can be very pre precise with that. Now, 6 MOA at 1x, it's not quite as easy to deal with that. But at the same time, if you're using this under about 150, that 6 MOA dot is very usable and very quick in a lot of uh, circumstances, especially with the excellent reticle. In fact, most of the time, I'm not even shooting with the dot on because I find the reticle so easy to see and pick up in you know dense areas with lots of stuff going on and all that kind of stuff. But again, for some of you, it might be a concern, so I wanted to go ahead and throw it out there. Another concern that's plagued the, the uh, Elkan Spectre in the past is going to be the zero shift. So with some of the older models, when you'd shift from 1 to 4x, 4x to 1x, you'd have a zero shift between those two settings. So where your shots were landing were not lining up with where you had it zeroed. So at 4x, it would always be the same, but you'd have like a 3 to 4. I even heard of a 12 MOA shift. Now, I have not seen that with any of the latest Elkans, uh, being the Gen 3 and above but I wanted to throw it out there in case you have one of the older ones. Now I know especially with a lot of the older military ones where you're looking at some really old generation models, they might be in need of service and you might see that shift between those two magnification levels. So it is something to be aware of in any case. The thing I dislike the most about the Elkan Spectre is definitely the mounting system. The Elkan Spectre uses the arms mounts, which are antiquated. Uh, they've been surpassed. Uh, in this day and age with uh, a lot of different things. So when you have an Elkan Spectre on your rifle, you're living in the year 2001, when you should be living in the year 2017 with some type of nice mount, such as you know, the American Defense mount that I have on this light, or something that's better than what the arms mount is. So I, I trust it very little. Um, I'm hoping that they do upgrade it. And so that is kind of the thing that's kind of aggravating. For such an expensive optic, um, you have kind of a poor mounting solution. Now in the case of the arms mounts, it also has a little places so that you can zip tie to make sure that the arms don't come loose or any of that type of thing. And I would definitely recommend that to ensure that this doesn't go anywhere. Um, personally, I haven't had any issues with mine, but it should have a better mounting system uh, given that technology has advanced. And with that arms mounting system, you don't have a good return to zero. So if you pull this optic off and you put it back on, uh, it's not going to return to zero, so you're going to need to re-zero your optic. You can compare that to some newer mounts, such as the Geisley Super Precision, where it has really excellent return to zero properties. So again, something to think of, how often are you swapping your optics? I don't know. For most of you, it probably isn't that much, but it is something to be aware of. In a day and age where we have battery life that is measured in five to ten years, trying to make things army and marine proof, that way they don't have to go into those gusts and do anything to them, because we don't trust them to do that. The Elkan Spectre is kind of a throwback. Um, we have a battery life minimum of around 660 hours, according to Elkan. Now, it usually lasts around 3,000 hours. Personally, I had never gone through a full battery on my Elkan, because again, I don't use the Illuminator reticle that much. But that's pretty much on par, and in fact, better than what, you've seen, what you're seeing in a lot of EOTech optics currently. Now, the only problem with it is that the battery is quite rare and it's hard to find. So, that is something to think about. My biggest problem with the Elkan Spectre is price. If you were to hop on Amazon or Optics Planet or something like that, the Elkan Spectre costs around 2.2K. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. Now, a lot of optics cost that much, but most low power variable optics or dual, dual roll optics like the Elkan Spectre don't cost that much. EOTech Voodoo and Vortex and some of those other ones are costing around 1,000, 1.2K, somewhere right around there. So this is quite expensive. So what it comes down to when I'm taking everything into consideration is what we're looking at is we're looking at a awesome optic for short barreled rifles. Um, on longer builds like 14.5, 16 inch, uh, I wouldn't recommend it, but it balances incredibly well on your SBRs. You have great light transmission. You have a very usable low power variable optic for night vision use, which is pretty rare from what I've seen. You also have excellent glass, great field of view, that type of stuff, and a very forgiving optic to use when shooting and around weird obstacles and that type of thing. It's an excellent optic. I like this optic quite a bit. I hate the mounting system, but nonetheless, with all that considered, I still like it quite a bit. Would I pay $2,200 for this optic? 
No, I would probably pay closer to 1500 somewhere around there. I think it's a very uh, reasonable sum. So when it comes down to it is you need to decide is this optic going to fit your applications and what you use it for. That's for you to find, figure out, not for me to tell you. So I hope that this was somewhat helpful to you. So when it comes to how I've set my Mark 18 up with the LCAN, let's talk about that for a second because I know there's going to be questions. I have it as far back as possible. Why is that? Because I like to have my nose off the charging handle and I like to have a little bit of length pulled out in the stock. If I had it further forward with the iron sight behind the optic, that would make it difficult to get that good length of pull that I like on this rifle. So that's why I have it so far back. Now at the same time, because it's so far back, I don't have a place for the iron sights under there. So I have to have them in front. So the first question is, can I see the iron sights through this optic at 1x? Yes, and they are usable. If this optic is completely destroyed, I probably have other problems because Anything that completely destroy this optic would probably completely destroy me. Now on the top, there are some rudimentary iron sights. How good are they? They're usable. Uh, it's about what you expect from iron sights that are four inches apart from each other, especially when you're right up on them. They're both kind of fuzzy when you're looking through them. Uh, I've tried them out. They work at distances up to about 20 uh, yards past that. Uh, you're kind of pissing into the wind. Now, uh, the two iron sights that I'm running up here are Knight's Armament because I like them and they're aesthetic. <laughs> they're probably, I'm sure there are better ones out there. Uh, up front here, I'm running a at PLC, which is a civilian version of the PEC-15. Doesn't have an adjustable illuminator, but I found that it works fine for most circumstances. On the other side, I have a Surefire Scout, and you can see both of these are attached to a pressure pad that I have tucked in underneath my at PLC. It's just one of the Surefire dual pads, and then I can activate the light using that little dual pad. Very similar to that first Mark 18 setup that I had. Up front, I have the Surefire War Comp because it is money, and then I have a Tango Down Grip right up here on the front. Now, this was all factory Daniels vents, except I changed a couple things. I've got a Geisley trigger in there, as always. And then I just sent this off and just got it back from Aero Precision. So I swapped out my Daniel Defense barrel because I wanted to try out a Hansen profile barrel from Ballistic Advantage. So Aero Precision was kind enough to do that for me. So I'm currently trying it out. I like the smaller gas port size quite a bit, even though I know that Daniel Defense is now putting out the correct gas port size on their barrels. But in any case, that is kind of my setup. I have a CQD on the side for my sling with an HK hook, running into a Blue Force Gear Vickers sling <laughs> from uh, Larry Vickers. It helps me. Quite a bit. Finally, running a B5 system SOP mod stock and just a Bravo Company gunfighter charging handle. All of it's awesome. I uh, hope that answers most of your questions. Let's get back to it. The Elkan Spectre looks cool, but it only looks so cool. If you don't get good training, you're not going to look cool shooting the Elkan Spectre. That's not cool. So make sure that you get training. Thank you for watching, guys. I appreciate your views. As always, look cool by getting good training. I've got nothing else for you today. Omega-3s are important to have in your diet. I'd recommend eating a good dose of salmon. Now, the problem is, is that with some of the uh, farmed salmon, you have a lot of contaminants in it. So try to get wild Alaskan salmon. Let's support the industry. Get some of that good omega-3. It's going to help prevent dementia and that type of stuff. And dementia isn't cool.